Good evening and welcome to News 360. From the news up here in Addison, we are I am Issa Moni. And I am Aisha Yakubu. First, the headlines. News 360 headlines is brought to you by Deluxe Paint, GT Bank, and Piccadilly Biscuits. Health experts call for training of more health workers to intensify cervical cancer screening in hard to reach communities. Contact. Right, we tell you the story of two brothers who have constructed a light aircraft using local materials. In mission tonight, work progressing on Krachik, Pandai, Wulensi, Benda Road after TV3 report on bar states of the major road. An international news. Seychelles president delivers speech in the Indian Ocean calling for better protection for world's seas. We have details including sports coming up this hour. Stay with us as we begin the news straight away. The College of Science at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology is exploring avenues to develop entrepreneurial skills for graduate employment. Under an informal consultative scheme dubbed Science Cafe, students are empowered to hire self-employment as a viable option in the world of work. Graduate unemployment has been a burden on the country as successive governments attempt intervention to offer job avenues. The rate of graduates in search of jobs keeps increasing in an already choked job environment. According to data from the Institute of Statistics, Social and Economic Research of the University of Ghana, only 10% of graduates find jobs after their first year of completing school. It may take up to 10 years for a large number of graduates to secure employment due to varied challenges from the lack of unemployable skills, unavailability of funding capital for entrepreneurship, as well as the low capacities of industry to absorb the huge numbers. A senior lecturer at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Dr. Reginald Annan, is not happy about young graduates solely relying on existing jobs for employment. The College of Science at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology has initiated the Science Cafe to help students focus on acquiring relevant and entrepreneurial skills to start their own businesses. Through informal consultation, students are psyched to be adequately positioned to compete in the job market. The kind of mindset that the students need to have to before they come out of their, their education system is very important. For them not to only think that they have to work specifically because they were trained as this, but also, also for them to not also think that they must work for somebody, but then there are things that they can do. Some students at the Science Cafe shared their thoughts on the discussion. I think the practical based education is what the government should look at and introduce the TVET. If it is being done, the implementation should be done well. So that as a student, right from the kindergarten, the student will have a skill to develop and not concentrate too much on the actual base. As educators, we learned that they must focus on transferable skills, giving students transferable skills um, so that they could be employable in various areas. Um, we also saw that there is a need for educators or universities to also train people um, towards the uh, priority areas of the country. We're trying to conscientize them, let them know that you don't necessarily have to wait for somebody to employ, but you have to look out for the skills that employers look out for in the labor market. The ones who have been trained as a graduate of a sort, you should be able to learn such skills even on your own. Entrepreneurial skills development has been identified as viable in preparing graduates for job creation. Now, female journalists in Ghana have been urged to rise up to challenge and realize their fullest potential. The call echoes the global movement of working together to elevate women, fight for parity, and strive for authority and promotion. Women are underrepresented in the media industry in Ghana. 
A cursory look at the media landscape shows men dominance in program hosting and managerial positions. Also, female safety in the journalism field has been a challenge for some time now. The Ghana Journalists Association and the International Federation of Journalists have therefore organized a two-day workshop to empower female journalists in the Ashanti region. The gender safety and equity training sought to adequately prepare female journalists to take up roles dominated by males. I realize that uh, sometimes you are being pushed to the wall as a female in the midst of men. But in all that, we are being taught uh, uh, there's no need to succumb to that pressure. You need to discharge your duties as a, a female journalist and, for that matter, uh, be able to contribute effectively uh, in, uh, in line of duty. Vice President of the Ghana Journalist Association, Linda Santiaji, wants to see women in the media having authority and financial parity to efficiently discharge their duties. We think that what men can do, the women can also do and even do better than that. So this is just to equip them, you know, with the knowledge and then some tidbits as to when they encounter such challenges. What are they supposed to do? Whom are they supposed to report this to? You know, how to handle such situations? And we know that female journalists are very vulnerable when it comes to safety issues. So this is just to equip them with the various measures and safety tidbits to know how to handle, you know, issues when, when they are confronted. Some of the participants shared their experience. We were schooled through so many things, and I learned that as a female journalist, I shouldn't look down on myself. I should also strive ahead and rock shoulders with the men. You know, there are a lot of females in this uh, work that we do that don't have courage, they don't have confidence. But this has proven to us that we can do more things than the men. I'll say in this workshop, I've learned how to be confident in my work and how to be independent to when it comes to media. Female journalists in the country have been taxed to venture into new territories to be impactful across the industry. The Ghana Journalists Association has meanwhile called on media houses to advance gender equity by engaging talented women with the tools to rise and lead within the media. And now, the Wright brothers changed the world with the invention of the aeroplane, which opened the world for aviation to begin and advance. Inspired by this feat, two brothers in Ghana, Isaac Otu and Jacob Labi, maybe the Labi brothers, have built a light aircraft using local materials. Porsche Gabo reports the brothers want the world to know it is possible to manufacture a plane in Ghana. My name is Isaac Otu. And I am Jacob Labi. We, we are two brothers. brothers. And I am Dora Dakwa. We, we are with Isaac Aviation. At a young age, Jacob and Isaac knew they were destined for greatness. At age eight, they manufactured their own car. Then, they decided to fulfill their long-standing dream of building an aircraft. In order to achieve this, they told me they started small in the backyard of their residence at Dom Pillar 2, and they used local materials such as iron square pipes, plywood and aluminum sheets to construct the light aircraft. We thank you, Jehovah Almighty. Today, the brothers who are junior high school leavers are here for a test run of the light aircraft at an airfield at Afenia in the Greater Accra region. Dora Dakwa is also here to learn from the brothers. Before the test run begins, they first need to check if everything is in order. Then, a battery is brought in to kickstart the engine. Contact. 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 Moving of ailerons. All right. Check it again. Yeah, the rudder and then the nose wheel. Yes, yes. Okay, the rudder, everything is all right. Over. 
and off goes Goffy 1601. Goffy 1601 can carry two people with a maximum weight of 757 kilograms. The wings are detachable for easy transportation. The engine, which runs on petrol, is a used Volkswagen engine which produces power to drive the propeller. of the Goffy 1601, a light aircraft manufactured by two brothers here in Ghana and they tell me they need financial support as well as a license to become like the Wright brothers, that's the forefathers in the aviation industry. The Ghana Civil Aviation has already given us the opportunity for this runway for testing the aircraft. The name of the aircraft is Goffy 1601. My name is Isaac. That's why the plane is God has favored Isaac. It's a gift from God. So if I stand up and say I will do something, I just started and doing it. We can use this aircraft for police to patrol around and also for our hospitals to also spray as a mosquito insecticide and also for farming to sprinkle the water to uh, uh, their farmings. We can also build as a cargo aircraft that can load things from a place to another place. Also for small, small medical things also, we can also use this aircraft to also do it, yeah. Jacob and Isaac told me they were able to construct the light aircraft through the assistance of an Air Force officer and by watching videos on YouTube. Although the aircraft can fly, they currently do not have the license to do so due to some challenges. Please, you see this one? This is called joystick. 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 Yeah. Dora Dakwa is understudying the brothers. She wants to become a pilot. In fact, I met one of the brothers and I, I admired their talent and decided to join. They have that God-given talent to build aircraft and when given the support, they can build in large quantities. So I'm appealing to the government and the general public to come to the aid of these brothers. They are set to transform the aviation industry in Ghana. What the brothers need now is financial support. We are not having a license, so uh, the, the, the law is not giving us permit to fly. So we need a license, and then the license also cost a lot. So we need a support from everyone, from the government, from individual, everyone. We need a support to do the insurance and, and, and to cover the aircraft along the line whilst we are doing the taxing test and then the flying test. We will also teach uh, 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 the, the youth so that uh, Ghana or Africa, we will become one best of uh, aircraft model and also uh, 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 in terms of piloting. They are hopeful someday, somehow, Goffy 1601 will fly in the skies. Porsche Gabo, TV3 News, Afinya. Yeah, I think that's Goffy attempting to fly there. But I'm sure, as they say, little drops of water develops mm -hmm. into a mighty mm -hmm. ocean. They need all the support, so I'm sure we have to give them. People in Dharma should be listening. Aviation Minister, are you there? That's such <laughs> an interesting report by Portia Gabo. And we wish Isaac and Jacob all the very best. Moving away from that, most Ghanaian women with cervical cancer are reporting late to health facilities for treatment. With their conditions at advanced stages, these patients do not survive the disease. Health experts are advocating the, for training of more health workers to intensify cervical cancer screening in hard-to-reach communities. Here's a report by Beatrice Spielgabra. Cervical cancer is caused by a common virus known as human papilloma virus, HPV. Each year, about 500,000 women globally are diagnosed with cervical cancer and more than 270,000 die from it. A large majority, about 85% of the global burden, occurs in the less developed regions where it accounts for almost 12% of all female cancers. Regardless of age, 
all females are exposed to the HPV, which can spread through skin contact and sexual intercourse. Risk factors of cervical cancer include early sexual experience, high number of pregnancies, and women who smoke. At the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital, records of women reporting the cervical cancer are not encouraging, as explained by the head of the Family Planning and Reproductive Health, Dr. Kojo Sabin. Women are more shy when you have to examine them vaginally than when you have to examine the breast. And even for breast cancer, you can teach the person to even do breast examination. But for cervical cancer, it's difficult to teach a woman how to examine her service. Screening for cervical cancer at the Konfanochi Teaching Hospital cost 40 cities, as the disease is not covered under the National Health Insurance Scheme. To step up interest in screening, Dr. Kojo Sabin recommends coverage of the disease under the NHIS while urging all nurses to be trained in cervical cancer screening. Women in their menopausal age are advised to immediately seek medical attention when they experience bleeding, which could be a sign of cervical cancer. And still on health, people living with Parkinson's disease want government to take steps to subsidize their medication. Ibrahim Abubakar reports patients say the cost of treating the disease is, is expensive, thus discourages more patients from reporting to hospital. Although there are no statistics of Parkinson's disease in Ghana, health officials say the disease is on the increase. About 20% of diseases diagnosed at the neurology clinic at Konfanochi Teaching Hospital are Parkinson related. The disease affects parts of the brain that regulates movement and speech. This causes tremor in the hand, stiffness, and slow movement. Dr. Vida Autry, founder of Parkinson's Disease Support Group, says diagnosing patients and inadequate drugs are major challenges. It, worldwide, there are abundance of drugs and treatment options, but in Ghana, we have only two drugs that are um, available, and for our patients, they cannot even afford the drugs. She called on members of the public to visit the hospital when one starts experiencing tremors in the hand and challenge in movement. Parkinson's disease is real. It's in Ghana. We, we do have patients in Ghana, both in Accra and in Kumasi. We have a lot of patients who have Parkinson's disease. And that if you have any relative, don't assume it's part of aging. A person needs an average of 1,000 CDs every month to purchase drugs to treat the disease. Some Parkinson's disease patients call for government support in accessing drugs for treatment. They also entreated the public to report to the hospital for treatment. Covered this in 2007, about 13 years ago. I realized that my hand, my hand was trembling and I, I reported to the hospital. Later on, I saw my, my speech was not forthcoming. I'm a pastor, so I had to re retire from, from work. I mean, this disease can affect anybody, you know, because uh, according to them, they don't know the, the, uh, the source of the uh, sickness. But I'm just advising all the public that if you find out this, this uh, shaking of hands and other things are in your body, then you have to report to the doctor. The Parkinson Disease Support Group provides a platform for patients who, among others, meet and share experiences, interact with health professionals, and encourage mutual support. The group also assists Parkinson disease patients with drugs and, and also creates awareness of the disease. Now, President Ekufuado has cautioned traditional leaders in the country not to plead for the release of criminal political thugs who cause mayhem on innocent citizens. The president was speaking at a deba held for chiefs and people of Kenyase on the second day of his working visit of the Ahaf region. The deba was an interaction session that provided the president the opportunity to learn at first hand the development challenges facing the people. The chief of Kenyansi number one, Nana Kofi Eberi, who spoke for the chiefs, commended the president for introducing some laudable initiatives like the free SHS, planting for food and jobs, as well as the creation of the Ahafu region. He however appealed to the president to address the poor road network in the area and provide the area with a vocational and technical institution. 
President Kofuado told the gathering government has plans to establish a technical and vocational education training center in Kenya. He appealed to the chiefs to make land available for the project. PDIC Kenya Road will be another a major priority for us. MCN Chair, TVET, 21 colleges are going to be established, new TVET institutions all over the country. The members say, say. The president again condemned acts of political violence and appealed to traditional leaders not to shield persons who engage in such acts, but allow justice to take its course. President Ekufuado and his entourage later visited the Tanoso brick and tiles factory to acquaint themselves with progress of work. The One District One Factory Secretariats facilitated the acquisition of an $18 million loan from the Exim Bank for construction to start about a year ago. The factory is situated on an 80-acre land. After completion, the factory will have the capacity to produce 125 tons of clay products per day, including floor and roofing tiles, brake blocks, and ceiling panels, amongst others. At the moment, structures including an auditorium, administration office, and a canteen have been completed. Chief Executive Officer of the Brake and Tile Factory, Carl Christian Local, said, when fully operational, the factory will provide jobs directly to 100 graduates and 400 factory workers. The next phase is for us to start the 10,000 square meter hangar that we are going to use for the factory. So when Exim releases the money, we'll start there. That's the next phase that we'll start. All the whites will start coming down to Ghana and then we'll start the whole project. At Jidwaya Nkwanta, the president debunked claims by his critics that he deceived Ghanaians with a lot of promises to come to power. He said he is working to fulfill promises made as evident by the implementation of the free SHS, planting for food and jobs, and the One District One Factory program. Youth in afforestation, planting for food and jobs. Say, 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 the deteriorating state of roads was a major concern for residents. President Kufuado told the people of Bechim the rehabilitation of their town roads has been captured in the $2 billion Sinohydro project. And the Asante Hinu Utun Fosei to the second has emphasized the need for more aggressive push towards girls' education in the country, addressing Queen Mother's at the Menshia Palace. Asante Hinu said it is important to collectively join efforts at making the school environment friendly for girls. Asante Hinu Utun Fosei to the second instituted a day to specially celebrate women as part of his 20th anniversary commemoration. The Queen Mother's Day brought together queens and other women leaders, including the Chief of Staff, Akosia Frema Sewa Opare, and wife of Asantehini Lady Julia Osei Tutu. The Asantehini Otunfo Osei Tutu lauded the role of women in Ghana's development. He believes women empowerment through education would significantly help fight poverty, reduce teenage pregnancy, and quicken the pace of national development. And Sana Sabi and Nebro for Cassam Janda, some Babanas, and Tinian Janda, some Nadada. Can you so cast and be as Yanko Busabroa? Ya cram with it to me, my Sante man now, him out to a china, some no yard, they were pin me, the American, you know, same jay, and I'm sorry, Kofi Kotieno. Chief of Staff Akosia Fremo Seopari reiterated government's commitment to partner with traditional and religious leaders to attain the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Yama Emma Edumaya and Tumpon Yampe a quam be soa Yabetua Emma school so Nayama woman a school no and quite Wife of the Asante Hene, Lady Julia Osei to advocated the empowerment of women for social transformation. 
Now, the Upper East Regional Coordinating Council and the Chiefs and People of Kusol Traditional Area have held an interdenominational funeral service for 57 victims who died in March 22 on, on the, an, in an accident on the Kintampo Tamale Highway. Now, 23 communities, both, both in Garu and Tempani District, were affected. Here's a report by Tanko Mohamed Rabiu. Families, traditional leaders, government officials, and the general public attended the service for the victims of the March 22 road accident on the Kintampo Tamale Road. A cock and a ram were sacrificed to the gods of Kusau to prevent future occurrences nationwide. A special prayer was said by the chief imam of Garu district, Al Haji Mohammed Sugaba, for the deceased and their families. The chairman of the local council of churches, headed by Reverend John Ananga, also prayed for the bereaved families. The Upper East Regional Minister Paulina Baege described loss of lives as painful and regrettable. He urged drivers to be cautious and also encouraged passengers to speak out when drivers go wrong. We are equally informed that five people in the Congo districts lost their lives. Two in the Bila district lost their lives, and two in the Kasna Nakana municipal, municipality also lost their lives. So aside the number that were lost in the Garu and Tempani areas, we have nine others that were lost in these three districts and municipalities I've mentioned. Boko Naba Asigri Abugrago Azoka II, in a speech read on his behalf, called on the Road Safety Commission, security forces and government to make sure long-traveling vehicles have two drivers each. As Yaba, a survivor, said he lost his wife, children and brothers in the accident. There must also be something like a passenger law that passengers can call vehicle owners or maybe the, the GPR2 or any other station where they are, uh, they, are, they are moving. They can hold them responsible for any negligence. There is a weather alert by NADMO based on the weather, weather warnings received from GMET. The general public, especially vehicle drivers, are hereby advised to avoid flooded areas and flooded roads. The rain is expected to go deep into the night, hence they need to be extra careful. Right, thank you NADMO for that advice. Ray, you're watching News 360, we'll return shortly with mission. Hello again and welcome to Mission. In Mission this evening, commuting and access to health facilities in Krache, Bandai, Wulensi and Nakpayili is now easier as the bad roads have been tarred. Government released funds for the reconstruction of the Krache, Bandai, Wulensi, Binda Road after TV3 Mission's constant rep report on the bad state of the major road. This is the routine form of commuting in Pandai. Access to healthcare in this area remains a major challenge due to the nature of roads. Not all health workers would wish to work in these areas, especially as community-based health planning and services, chiefs facilities in hinterland communities. Those posted there are doing their best to save lives in the midst of limited resources and logistics. In communities where there are no means of transportation, outreach programs are not a priority and the consequences are dire. Roads here are deadly and increase traveling hours. Pandai is the hub for yams, but most farmers lost interest in farming as there are no good roads to cut farm produce for sale. Three months after a mission report on the plight endured by commuters on the stretch, government released funds for the construction of the road, linking Ketekrachi through Pandai, Willensi to join the Eastern Corridor Road at Binda Junction. The contract for the 75-kilometer road was awarded in 2016, but work did not commence due to lack of funds. Contractors. First Sky Limited and Jianzi Nonferous Construction Limited moved to site and brisk work has been done. 
The people of Banda, Bandai, Wilensi, Nakpayili, and Binda are using a third road for the first time in more than four decades. What this means is that traveling hours have been shortened and access to healthcare also not much a problem. The Chinese firm, Jianzi Non Ferrous Construction Limited, has completed the application of second coat on its portion of the road, while First Sky Limited is yet to complete its portion. Resident engineer at the Ghana Highways Authority, Engineer Solomon Ejay, gave more details about the project. What happened was that uh, the contractor started most of his uh, concrete works, but the earthworks delayed due to financial constraints on the contractor. Both contractors are to complete their project within a period of 36 months. Commuters are happy. For those born in Pandai and have never moved out of the district, this would be their first time seeing and using a third road because there is none anywhere in the district. Member of Parliament for Pandai, Matthew Nyendam, who is happy about the progress of work, never kept mute. The town roads itself are almost done because it's just left with some few portions to be awarded. And like you rightly said, from Pandai towards Banda, that's the voter region, or you can call it the new OT region, the roads are almost done. If you move from Pandai to Binda, that is the Bimbla Wolensi Road, it's almost done. And last week, the Minister for Roads and Highways has approved the Salaga Bandai Road that is going to be awarded. I will not be surprised if next week that project is advertised to make sure that that road is also constructed. District Chief Executive for Bandai, Emmanuel Ata Tatablata, is hopeful government would pay attention to other bad roads in the districts. More resources would be required to address the issues bordering bad roads, improve healthcare accessibility, as well as improve the socio-economic lives of the people in Pandai and its surrounding districts. Stanley Nibleu, TV3 News, Pandai, Northern Region. Now, the roof of the Tinkarini Evangelical Presbyterian School in the Pandai district of the northern region that got dislodged by a rainstorm in February last year has been re-roofed. MP for Pandai, Matthew Nindam, stepped in after TV3 Mission's persistent reportage on the harsh condition the disaster posed to staff and pupils of the school. In February last year, a rainstorm ripped off portions of the roof of the Tikarini Evangelical Presbyterian Basic School. The situation exposed both teachers and pupils to danger as the assembly was slow in responding to the plight of the school. The dislodged roofing sheets hang loosely on the building and makes noise whenever the wind blows. It was a tough time for staff. Member of Parliament for Pandai, Matthew Nyendam came to the aid of the school and re-roofed the whole school building. This was after TV3 aired on two occasions the danger that the state of the school posed to pupils and teachers. The Pandai District Assembly supervised the re-roofing. The MP that is fixing it from his uh, MP Common Fund, he's fixing it for the community. And these are some of the interventions that the MP is doing. It has been given to contract about 110 both teachers and pupils are now happy. This one is a blessing, as we can talk about, for the fact that when this building was roofed by the storm, a lot of things were going wayward. But for now, with the stakeholders on board, this time we say we thank God for the work done. A contract has also been awarded for the painting of the building. Teachers are happy. TV3's presence in the district has yielded positive impact. As you people have come, it has made a lot of people, those who were thinking that maybe what we're seeing was something, a minor thing, as it was being put onto the air, they realized that really what we're seeing was a serious thing. Hence, for this, they also made a follow-up through that, that we have seen that this particular school has now put into this particular phase. So that is why we are saying that it has helped us a lot. Established some 15 years ago, the school serves more than 150 pupils from Tikarini 
and four other adjoining communities, but lacks teaching and learning materials. Decks are inadequate. In some classes, it is a privilege for pupils to sit on broken pieces of desks. Even this is done on first-come, first-served basis. This affects academic work as pupils are compelled to sit in awkward positions to write while instructional hours are lost. As pupils strive to assess education, it behoves on stakeholders to provide quality education at the basic level and improve the conditions under which studies are conducted. Stanley Nibleu, TV3 News, Tikarini, Pandai, Northern Region. And that's how we wrap up this edition of Mission. Remember, Mission is brought to you by Star Ghana with funding from the NIDA, UK Aid, and the EU. Thanks for your time. Now let's go to the Ashanti region where the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly has secured a 40 million CD loan facility to complete the abandoned growth from market. Government's approval for the KMA to contract the loan means the project which has stalled for the past 12 years will now be completed. Construction of the crow fruit market started in 2007 as part of government's Golden Jubilee project, but has been abandoned. The market, when completed, will accommodate over 500 stores and shelves and enhance business activities in the Kumasi metropolis. The market site is currently overgrown with weeds, serving as a hideout for criminals. Addressing the Kumasi Metropolitan Assembly's fourth session, of the 7th Assembly, Metropolitan Chief Executive Osei Sibe Entry disclosed Fidelity Bank Ghana will provide funding for the project. The consultants among their design services has therefore caused the contractors back to site. The Metro will also be converting a part of the Kumasi Zoo to serve as a holding bay for various transport unions who load passengers at Kumasi Secondary Technical School has been hit with furniture shortage with most first-year students admitted under the double-track system struggling to access desks in classrooms. School authorities say most of the desks have been broken down and have not been repaired or replaced. Chairs and tables in the dining hall have been converted into desks to minimize the plight of the students. Other students use plastic chairs. The headmaster of Kumase Secondary Technical School, Haruno Pombwating, said the situation is affecting teaching and learning. We are short of about 2,500 monitors. When we start doing the writing the core papers, we have about 1,427 registered students. So whenever we are going to write, uh, the core, the school will be closed. The students will be, will be idling about, and that does not work for discipline. This came to light when Breast Care International and Peace and Love Hospital inspected progress on a 500 capacity assembly hall complex for the school. The philanthropic gesture was triggered by the non-availability of a facility to accommodate students during a breast cancer screening exercise in the school. President of Breast Care International, Dr. Beatrice Wiafia Dai, reiterated her commitment to help improve on infrastructure in the school. When we came, I realized the students were standing under the trees. So I asked, what will happen if it rains? And they told me, in case it rains, they normally call. Now, the paramount chiefs of Mampurugu, Mahami, Bohogu, Sheriga, and Gunja, Nairi, Yagbongura, Tuntumba, Boru Isa the first have released 10 acres of land each to the Ghana Police Service for the construction of a regional police headquarters. The move is to facilitate the speedy construction and operation of the regional police administration. 
The two paramount chiefs of the newly created Northeast and Savannah regions donated the parcels of land when the Inspector General of Police, David Asantia Pietu, paid a courtesy call on them at their separate palaces during his two-day tour of the regions. In the Northeast region, the IGP visited Pasingpe in the West Mampusi municipality where a police post is being constructed. He also visited crime scenes of armed robbery attacks and the scene where a manager of the Ghana Water Company was killed in January this year. The IGP also called on the Nairi, Mahami, Abdullahi, Sheriga, where he was taken to a 10-acre land donated by the king for the construction of a regional police headquarters. The IGP noted the service would provide more police officers and logistics for patrols to clamp down on crime in the area. At the Jakpa Palace in Damango, the IGP expressed commitment to combating highway robbery, particularly on the Fufu Susola Road. We are going to provide you with uh, some logistics immediately, uh, not only your district but the Savannah region, so that uh, the people in the old communities will also be happy. He appealed to the youth to assist the police to fight crime by making available information to them. You're live on News 360. We're also live on DSTV Channel 279. And it was an all-girls affair last night on TV Street's Music Music. Here are highlights of the show. The enviable TV Three's Music Music stage has seen top-notched artists, rock studio audience, as well as viewers at home with great back-to-back -back tunes every Saturday night. <laughs> It was an all-female affair this Saturday. Controversial Ya Jackson did what she is best known for. Black Avenue Music sensational female MC Frida Rhymes also thrilled the audience. Then came the hottest female rapper, Eno Baroni. My first time on Music Music was, I think, 2015. But this time around, you know, I'm just matured now. I have grown over the years and then I've grown within spirit, maturity, performance and then fan base. So I think that is what came together for this performance. This is my first time being on TV3 Music Music and trust me, it was amazing. I loved my performance, the crowd, they were everything. And I wish I could perform again honestly because I really had fun on stage. Ohima Dadao brought down the curtains on the night. <laughs> Now, the Great War has come, the war has fallen, and the Night King's army of the dead marches towards Westeros. The end is here. Now, but who will take the Iron Throne as the eighth and final season of HBO's fantasy drama television series Game of Thrones, scheduled to premiere today, comes to a close? Naftali Ba explores how the saga of ice and fire will ultimately come to a close. George R. R. Martin's best-selling book series, A Song of Ice and Fire, is brought to the screen by HBO. It depicts two powerful families, kings and queens, liars and honest men, all playing a deadly game for control of the seven kingdoms of Westeros and to sit on the Iron Throne. We will defeat it. We're the last Lannisters. 
for seven seasons, you have watched characters lie, bleed, and sacrifice for the Iron Throne. A season 8 trailer opens with the terrified Aya sprinting away from an unknown enemy through Winterfell Corridor. The scene then casts what seemed to be an earlier shot of her holding a dagger made of dragon glass, one of the two materials that can kill white walkers and whites. The eighth and final season of Game of Thrones is just hours away and fans are eager to find out how the saga of ice and fire will ultimately come to a close. It is probably not much of a spoiler to say the humans in Game of Thrones will soon do battle with the White Walkers because that's what has been building all series long. However, what is even more interesting is the fact that the set battle is expected to take place at Winterfell where the wall has fallen and white walkers are running past the wall led by Jaqen and his dragon. He's coming for us. For all of us. One army, a real army, united behind one leader with one purpose. You'll be rolling over a graveyard if we don't defeat the Night King. As the final season approaches, how will the Night King and his army of White Walkers be defeated? And who sits on the Iron Throne? Fingers are crossed. And then it doesn't matter whose skeleton sits on the Iron Throne. Fingers hmm. are definitely crossed. Are you definitely. a fan of Game of Thrones? I can't wait for it to start. I, I mean, already see. our social media pages are blipping. All and of us are waiting to see what happens. Absolutely, tonight. absolutely. For what I've read, it's going to be great, so I can't wait to talk. That's it for this edition of News 360. You can check our website for updates and breaking news. I'm Isamoni. And I am Aisha Yakubu. Have a good evening.